room talking about coronavirus and giving you facts. We're not promoting fear. We just want to kind of get the conversation going. So we've been featuring a different expert all this week, and we're going to keep it going from here on out. With me right now is Ken Stedman. He is a biology professor at PSU. Um, and on his profile, if you look him up, he is called the Virus Hunter. Um, welcome. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you for having me. So before we dive into a little bit about your background, I do want to let everybody know that if you have questions for Ken, He's not a medical doctor, but he is an expert on viruses and the spread of viruses. So text us at 503-226-5111. And if you'd like, tell me your name because we'll, we'll answer you and we'll put your questions to Ken. So what the heck did you do to get the moniker Virus Hunter? What all do you do at PSU? So I do probably too many different things at PSU, which is a start, but the virus hunter really comes from me being very interested in what are the limits that viruses can survive at. So I go to volcanic hot springs throughout the world, basically as extreme as it gets, and I try and find the viruses that are present in these environments. Hmm. So I've been to Kamchatka, I've been to Iceland, I've been to Japan, been to Yellowstone, basically going and poking around hot springs, particularly the very high temperature acidic hot springs, mm -hmm. to try and find viruses there. And it turns out these viruses are totally different than any virus anybody's ever seen before. They don't make us sick, um, but they do make the microbes that are in those hot springs sick. Huh. And so we're also interested in how that interaction is taking place. So yeah, I pack up my lab, we do a road trip down to Lassen Volcanic National Park, and we'll look for viruses for a weekend. And we'll, we do that every year, and this summer will be another one. Okay, so I'm gonna put a pin in that just for a second, because sure. I do wanna get back to that eventually. But let's focus on the coronavirus, because I've heard a lot of doctors and a lot of people talk about coronavirus started in China, in Wuhan, in a wet market with lots of different animals. But can you walk me back, maybe even further than that, and tell me how the heck we got here? How did COVID-19 end up causing such a problem for us stateside? What do we know about its origins? So that's a great question. And um, the answer is we don't completely know, mm. but what we've been able to do is sort of a molecular process. We're kind of a detective search to try and figure out where this particular virus is causing the COVID-19 disease. We actually call it now SARS-CoV-2, which is just a horrible name, but <laughs> I didn't come up with that. Um, and so this SARS-CoV-2 pretty clearly originated in bats originally. And the reason we know that is if you look at bats, bats have a massive amount of diversity of coronaviruses in bats. Way more coronaviruses in bats than in any other animal anybody's ever seen. Mm -hmm. Now we've got four or five different coronaviruses that infect us, but bats have probably hundreds of different wow. coronaviruses. And so that's the first sort of indication that it probably came from bats because there are way more coronaviruses in bats. But then if you also look specifically at the genes that are present in this particular, you know, the viruses causing you know, COVID-19 right now in us, those are extremely similar to a bat virus that was found by the Chinese in some caves in China that's not identical to the one which is infecting humans now, but it's so similar that it's highly likely that this virus that's infecting us and the one that's infecting the bats came from a common ancestor probably not that long ago. So probably there was a bat virus. Mm -hmm. That bat virus then somehow got into humans. And that's where the big question is right now. We don't completely understand what that is. But what might one of the chain of events be that went from bat to human? Like what happened in between? Yeah, so again, great question. We don't know. Um, but if you, again, you look at these sequences and you think about, as you mentioned before, these, these wet markets in China where you have lots of live animals that are for sale, mm -hmm. some of them legally, some of them less legally. Um, and that appears to be at least where this particular coronavirus, which is infecting us now and is causing these epidemics, that's where there was a big focus of this particular virus. And so probably what happened is there were some wild animals in that market 
that were infected by a bat virus originally. And so how, you may ask, you know, how does a bat virus end up in some of these animals in a wet market? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Um, so what we think happened, and again, this is projection, but mm -hmm. again, given the molecular detective work that a lot of people have been doing, not me, but lots of other people have done, is that it looks as if this particular virus probably came out of a bat, and the way things come out of bats is usually in their guano. Mm -hmm. So, um, and coronaviruses in bats are mostly intestinal viruses. They're not mm. respiratory viruses. Quite why that is is not entirely clear, but so probably came out in the bat guano. And then some other animal probably either at that guano, was exposed to it somehow. That then ended up in the wet market. Might have been pangolins, and you may have heard about the pangolins before. I think not many people are familiar. Can okay. you describe what a pangolin is? Yes. So a pangolin is kind of a cross between an anteater and an armadillo. Um, oh, wow. They're actually really cute. Go and look them up online. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're these really fascinating mammals which have scales. They're only mammals which have scales. Mm. And apparently those scales are really prized in traditional Chinese medicine. Even though they're illegal to be traded in, mm. there ends up being a lot of trade of them. Apparently the meat is also something that lots of people are interested in. So um, why pangolins, you may ask? <laughs> so it turns out, as I mentioned, you know, the virus which is infecting us is actually very similar to bat viruses in almost all of its genes. But there's a small part in that, you know, in the virus genes that's infecting us that looks more like a pangolin virus than it does like a bat virus. Oh, interesting. So then they've intermingled, perhaps. So we've got the bat and the pangolin and this new virus that has morphed and is passed to humans if they, what, eat the pangolin? How does that happen? Presumably. So presumably, again, great point is that probably there was this kind of you know interaction that took place. We call it recombination, recombination. in the virus world. Okay. Um, and that probably ha would have happened you know in the pangolin or some other animal. In the case of SARS back in 2003, it was probably pretty clearly a civet cat where this happened. And again, it's this you know, recombination that happened between the different viruses. But then after that, it's in this particular animal. Then it's got to transfer somehow to humans. Now, how did that happen? Probably not by being eaten. That's kind of unlikely. Okay. Um, somehow it's ended up in our lungs. And now clearly now this particular coronavirus and all coronaviruses in humans are really mostly spread through respiratory tracts, sneezing, coughing, etc. So maybe the pangolin sneezed or there's just lots of aerosol. Any of these markets in China are incredibly packed. Everything's very, very close together. All the animals are packed, just as cages stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So it could be that you know some kind of either fecal matter or aerosol droplets from the animals then spread to people in the market, and then from there spread then to other people. Wow, uh, that's an amazing um, just kind of progression of what could be. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, we don't know 100%. Mm -hmm. um, now that it's here, what are some of the things that we can do to stop the spread or at least slow the spread. I know one thing, when Ken came in here today, what did we do? We did not shake hands. He did a little elbow bump, which is smart. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what all can we do? So what we can do, basic hygiene is really one of the major things that we should do, hand washing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's probably one of the very few things that I've changed in my normal routine since we've had this particular outbreak of COVID-19. Wash my hands a lot more, mm. wash them for a long time, lots of soap back and front. Um, so that's one thing that seems to actually probably be the best way to slow down the spread is literally this hand washing. Second thing to do is if you are sick, stay home. Don't go and spread whatever you have to everybody else who's out there. One of the things probably the hardest thing to do is don't touch your face yeah. um, unless you've washed your hands like right beforehand. Mm -hmm. All of us are really bad at washing your face and touching your face, excuse yep. me. Washing your face is important too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that process. So washing your hands, don't touch your face, stay home when you're sick mm -hmm. um, if you possibly can. Um, and the other thing to do, I think not so much in terms of stopping the spread of the disease, but just being prepared, as you say, yeah, facts, not fear. Mm -hmm. And what I like to say is to, you know, 
be prepared, don't be scared. I like and it. And so think through that process. What you would do if you had to stay home for two weeks and you know, we're quarantined, if your kids weren't in school, just go through that process, think about it. And as a university professor at PSU, I've been thinking about what would happen with my students if I happen to you know, not be there or the students couldn't be there. So one of the things that fortunately I've been doing already is I post all of my lectures online. They're on YouTube. You can check out my YouTube channel, uh, get all the lectures. Actually, I actually have people from all throughout the world who are listening to my lectures, which still is strange to me because listening to my own voice, as you probably know, <laughs> sounds really strange. It's hard to get used to it first, absolutely. <laughs> it's very, very strange. So that's one thing. And then um, also just be a little bit flexible about mm. things. And it may not be the student who is sick. Maybe their kids are sick. Maybe their parents are sick. And that's actually much more likely, particularly with this coronavirus. Mm -hmm. It's the old people who are getting sick. It's not the kids. Mm -hmm. But another huge open question now is what is the role of kids in the disease? What are do you they, mean by that? So are they getting sick and just we're not seeing it, um, but they're still transmitting? Are they not getting sick at all? These are questions that we really don't have a good answer to mm -hmm. right now. So I think that's one of the things that a lot of researchers are trying to understand now is what is the role of children and what are the role of schools as well? And this is important in terms of trying to think about should we be closing, well, excuse me, should we be closing schools? Mm. Should we be leaving them open? You know, what's the appropriate thing to do? And there are, there are definitely arguments one way and the other. So the more we can find out about it, the better. And a lot of that gets to one of the things that I'm really adamant about, and you can ask any of the people I work with, data, data, data. I'm a complete mm. data junkie. So um, we need more data. We need more data about the coronavirus, particularly about what's happening with kids, um, to try and figure out what's the appropriate response to have. You know, is closing schools the right thing to do? It's incredibly disruptive. Mm -hmm. And so you know, what do you do about that? And we're getting more data every day. Exactly. We're learning more. So I'm just going to ask, uh, um, I'm going to get a couple questions from viewers. Sure. Um, do things spread faster in the warmth or cold? And are you worried about the spread? OK, so that's a great question. And the answer is, just like I said before, we don't have data on this. We don't know, at least not for the coronavirus. For flu, influenza, definitely there is more spread during the colder parts of the year. Mm -hmm. It's still not entirely clear why that is, which is another reason to get your flu shot. <laughs> so influenza and coronavirus are two different things. So how does the flu shot morph into protection for anything else? Okay, that's a, a great question. And just to be very clear, you're exactly right, is that Flu and the coronavirus are very, very different viruses, but we have a vaccine for flu. We don't have a vaccine for the coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. So if you're vaccinated for flu, even if you do get the disease, really good data show that the kind of symptoms you get are a lot lower if you've been vaccinated. That means you don't have to go to the ER. You don't have to see your doctor. If you don't go to the ER, you're not going to be using the resources that other people will be using for coronaviruses, mm. and you're less likely to be exposed to someone who might have a coronavirus Got and it. might be in the ER. Got it. No, that makes total sense. Um, somebody else is asking, can you get the coronavirus more than one time? Can you be infected by the coronavirus more than once? Again, open question. We don't have great data on this. It's probable that at least once you're originally infected, then you will get an immune response, and that will protect you over some period of time mm -hmm. from getting reinfected. The big question is, how long is that some period of time? You know, mm -hmm. Is it a year? Is it two years? The data that people have looked at from SARS looks as if it's probably on the order of a couple of years. So you might need, assuming that we've developed a vaccine and we're trying really hard to develop vaccines, mm -hmm. um, that once you have a vaccine, you might need to get a booster, actually not unlike what we have now with 
the seasonal influenza after a couple of years. But these are all things that are way down the road right now. Why all, I mean, I know it's a complicated process, but why does it take so darn long to get a vaccine? You've got all these people around the world working on it, but they're still saying it's maybe a year out. So why? Um, the main thing as far as vaccines are concerned is safety. Mm. Because you don't want to take someone who is not sick and by giving them a vaccine, make them sick. Mm. So the safety processes that you have to go through for drugs, but particularly for vaccines, because you're not, you're not giving to somebody who's sick, you're giving them to someone who's not sick. You want to make sure that there's complete safety. So the first thing that happens is you do testing in animals just to make sure that that's something doesn't make the animals sick, but mice aren't humans. <laughs> and so you have to then check once you've gone through all bunch of animal studies, then you do just safety studies in humans, what they call a phase one trial. Then you do some safety and efficacy trials, which then takes another multiple months. And then finally you do the, so the phase three trial, which takes then you know, another probably six months or so. So just literally the safety and e efficacy mm -hmm. takes about a year. And that's partly why we don't have a SARS vaccine because it was all done by the time the vaccine was developed. Mm -hmm. And for the Ebola vaccines, which are great vaccines, by the way, um, those were just being developed while the big Ebola outbreak was happening. It was really right at the end that they were actually being able to be tested. Mm -hmm. Now, in the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, they're actually able to use these vaccines because they'd been tested in the last outbreak. Mm -hmm. And because people had been developing them, turns out the Ebola vaccine was developed decades ago. And fortunately, people had done enough work that they were able to start with that clinical testing when they had the West Africa outbreak. Mm -hmm. So when I think of viruses, I think of these indestructible, um, mutating. It's like, why are all the bad viruses the things that we can't seem to get rid of sometimes? Um, can you kind of walk me through that process? And are all viruses bad? So absolutely fabulous question. And one of the things that I always like to say, viruses have a bad rap. They have a bad rap? <laughs> They've got a really bad rap because we think, and it makes sense, total sense to think about it. In fact, viruses are named from poisonous slime in Latin originally. So Is that what it means? Yeah, that's, 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 that's the original Latin. But so people have been interested in viruses that make people sick. But it turns out the more that we've been learning about viruses, particularly in the last few years, as soon as we've started looking in general environments, not just in places where things are sick, there are lots of viruses that actually play a positive role. So there actually are some good viruses. There's a couple of examples that I'd, I'd just love to share with you. One of them actually has to do with the hot spring environments that we work with. Mm -hmm. When we go out into these places like Yellowstone, Lassen Volcanic National Park, we'll see this, this plant called panic grass um, right next to some of the hot springs. Turns out panic grass can grow at temperatures about 120 or 130 degrees Fahrenheit, which is absolutely amazing that they can grow under those conditions. The only reason they can do that is because they're infected with a fungus and that fungus is infected with a virus. Oh, wow. So a virus is giving it that supercharge to yeah. flourish. To be able to survive under those huh. extreme environments. You get rid of the virus, it won't work. You get rid of the fungus, it won't work. So that's there are some examples, very specific examples like that one, where this is beneficial for whatever's being infected by the virus. But if you think about it from a big picture point of view, mm -hmm. All viruses, the way a virus makes more virus is it has to infect something. And whatever that something is, it's usually called a host. So in the COVID-19 case, you know, it's us. Mm -hmm. And so the virus infects us. What do we do? We make more virus. So it's good for the virus. But that only happens when a host gets infected. If there's no host, then there's no virus. So the worst possible thing that a virus could do, now to totally over-anthropomorphize here, <laughs> uh, the worst thing that a virus could do is kill off its host because then it couldn't make any more virus. So it has a reason to keep us around? Is that what yeah, you're telling yeah, us? Well, we coexist? Again, that's rather over-anthropomorphizing, <laughs> sure. but, but that's the basic idea. And, that's and if you look at lots of viruses, it does seem that they're kind of balanced. You remember we were talking about those bat viruses? You remember all those coronaviruses in the bats? Yes. 
the bats seem to be perfectly happy with those coronaviruses. So those have probably co-evolved mm -hmm. in such a way that, yeah, that you don't want to be killing off your host. You want to be a, you know, sort of coexistence, a nice stable coexistence, because that's then good for the virus. It's potentially good for the host. But at least there's this sort of, you know, truce which has happened between the two. So I don't want to run out of time because sure. the thing that Ken told me, I have never heard of this before, but I think it's fascinating. We are using, in an experimental phase, but it's worked in some cases, taking a virus and having it cure a bacteria infection or a problem or a disease. Can you just share that? A little bit with us? Yeah, so this is something called phage therapy. Phage. Or bacteriophage therapy. Okay. So as I mentioned before, you know, there are lots of viruses really everywhere. And there are a number of viruses that infect bacteria. And some of those viruses make the bacteria really sick. Well, as you know, some bacteria can make us really sick. Well, what if you sort of you know, fight fire with fire? Maybe you can use some of these bacterial viruses to kill off the bacteria, which is making us sick. So this is something, again, called phage therapy. was developed in what used to be the Soviet Union for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a place in the Republic of Georgia now that's probably in Tbilisi, which is probably the leading place for this. But there have been some really amazing examples, and this is really now growing in the US. Um, there's a group at University of California, San Diego, where one of, in fact, a professor of medicine was in Egypt on holiday, got infected by this nasty bacterial disease, Acinetobacter, and came back. Nothing could be done for him. He was in a coma until his wife had found out something about what was going on with these bacterial diseases and basically sent out on all hands, you know, anybody have a virus that might be able to treat this? They were able to find a particular virus that infected this bacteria treated this fellow. He's now one of the directors of that institute. He gives TED Talks, et cetera. It's a oh, really wow. fabulous story on how using the virus to attack the bacteria. And this is really important in this day and age because we've got lots of antibiotic resistance. And so antibiotic resistant bacteria, these now can actually hopefully be treated with some of these viruses. Okay. Um, boy, I could go off on a major tangent with you. Um, is there anything else in the last little bit that we have that you feel that um, you would like to say that I didn't ask you about um, coronavirus, especially because that's top of mind for a little right. uh, for a lot of people? But is there anything that you that we haven't touched on? I think we probably covered most mm -hmm. everything. Again, it bears um, you know, wash your hands, yep. avoid touching your face, stay home. Also, um, cough into your elbow, elbow bump. Um, that's always a good thing to do. And be prepared. Again, be prepared, okay. don't be scared. So real quick, um, can someone who has been around the virus but not tested positive be a carrier? That's somebody else's question. Okay, yes, so the answer is again, we don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, we suspect that when someone's around someone who's had the virus, has been diagnosed, that they could potentially be a carrier. And that's one of the reasons that we're testing people who are really close contact, particularly family members of people who have been diagnosed. So these are people who the public health groups, and that's actually something I should mention, um, Oregon.gov, um, Oregon Health Authority um, is a great place to go and get information. Okay, absolutely. and because you are a wealth of information and you are online, we'll give you a little plug zone. Where can people find more about Ken Stedman? So uh, there's my website, extremeviruses.org. Okay. And also I'm relatively active on Twitter, particularly as far as what I think some of the good data are now on coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Extreme virus prof with an X-T-R-E-M-E, -E, virus prof, pretty easy to find. Um, just find me on Twitter. Okay, I'm going to get on my phone after we're done, and I'm going to follow you for sure. And again, here at KGW, we want to give you the facts. We don't want to freak you out. We don't want to, you know, cause any extra uh, concern because there's enough of it out there. So we appreciate you, Ken Stedman, coming in here and sharing your expertise. We have a team of people who are still going to be looking at the questions that you text us. So just because we're off the stream doesn't mean that you can't just uh, get on your phone and text 503 Six five one one one, and we're going to try and answer as many questions as we can. So, Ken, thank you. Let's one more time. Thank you, Brenda. All right, fun. we'll see you on the stream next time. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so oh. much.